there and send the signals to your brain to say, hey, I'm smelling this, I'm smelling that, and they, sing, they, they signal in combination with one another to give us the different smells that we experience. Now, common sense tells you that your dog can do that at a level that you cannot. Okay, your dog can smell things that you can't. They have a much more acute sense of smell than humans do. And it's probably a good thing. If you're going to live in a condensed environment with a bunch of other organisms in close proximity, it's probably not such a bad idea that we don't smell as well as dogs, right? Would you really want to smell like a wolf and live in a, you know, work in a cramped cubicle and have hugely acute smelling? Well, probably not. Okay. The interesting, the interesting result is based on sequencing projects in dogs, humans, other organisms, is that among mammals, we pretty much have the same number of genes for smelling. But in humans and in other primates, the vast majority of those genes are inactivated. They've been mutated, but they're still there. And they're still in the same order that we would expect them to be, the same location that we would expect to be, but they've been inactivated due to mutation. Okay. What's even more compelling is that not only, say, do humans have inactivated versions of these genes, chimpanzees have these inactivated genes as well. They're in the same location, and it's the exact same sequence change mutation in both species. So here's just one example. What you're looking at here in this <coughs> column are different gene names. These are just technical names for these different genes. What these numbers are indicating is what's the defect in these genes that is preventing these genes from functioning. A stop means that the code, instead of having, we talked about how those different sets of DNA letters give you the different amino acids. One of, this, one of those, or actually three of those different sets tell the cellular apparatus, stop making protein, stop here. So a mutation that inappropriately puts that signal too soon in a protein will make it stop early. When it stops early, the protein most often doesn't function anymore. So that's what a stop means. So for this example, say if we look at this one here, the number just indicates the position in the gene where that mutation occurred. And what we look at in this species, in this, at this gene, in humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas, is that not only are they all defective for this particular gene, they all have the same identical mutation that removes the function of that gene. Here's another one, all three. Here's another one that's all three. Here's one where it's shared between humans and chimpanzees, but there's still a functional version of this gene in gorilla. Another example, shared by humans and chimps, absent from gorilla, Separate mutation seems to have removed this in orangutan. Does everybody see the logic here? Okay. Now, why on earth would humans have mutated versions of genes that they don't use? And moreover, why on earth would humans have the exact same mutations as what we see in other species that are predicted to be related through common ancestry? Well, common ancestry explains that readily. If this mutation occurred at a time when these three species were not separate species, but in fact were the same species, then this mutation has simply been handed on through heredity to all the descendant species of that original species. Now, if we take this analysis, take a certain subset of these defective genes, these defective genes are called pseudogenes, pseudo just meaning false gene, gene, so false gene, or remnants of a gene, and let's say, okay, based on these pseudogenes alone, and based on this small subset of these uh, olfactory receptor pseudogenes, how would we arrange a pattern of heredity based on this evidence alone? Just saying, okay, organisms that share the most defective genes in common, we will group more closely together, and organisms that share less of these defects in common, we will place more widely apart. Does everybody follow the logic? So this is an independent arrangement of how we would describe the relatedness of species just sh based on their shared genetic errors. And when you see that, it falls out exactly as you would predict based on 
every other criteria that we've talked about tonight. So not only do they share the same defects, humans share more of those defects in common with chimpanzee, less so with gorilla, less so with orangutan. And every, every defect that's present between these two species is present farther up the tree. So there are no out of place mutations. We never see identical inactivating mutations in two species that are not proposed to have shared a common ancestor at a more close relationship. Does that make sense? There's only basically one way you can order these things based on sequence similarity and the pattern that you get when you do that analysis exactly replicates the proposed relationships based on every other criteria that we've looked at tonight. And the red numbers represent? The red numbers represent how many are unique to a given species. Okay. So humans have lost quite a few, but none of these inactivations are present in yeah. chimpanzees. Chimps have four They're that new. are new, humans have 15 that are new, but these three here are shared between those. These three here are shared between all of those. Right. This one here is shared between everything. Okay. So we only, if it ever shows up, in a, basically in a, in a relatedness, we see it in all branches. In other words, once you have a specific pseudogene, you don't lose it. You continue to inherit it, and it persists. All right. The rest is sort of just piling on on that point. And I think in terms of time, why don't we skip over? But the point here is that while I've shown you a few examples of this type of thing, we, don't, we not only see this once or twice, in the genome, we see it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And in every case, what we see is exactly what we would predict based on common ancestry. There's nothing out of place. All those variants that we see, they're in the exact pattern that we would predict based on the common ancestry that was originally assembled based on non-molecular criteria. Alrighty, so... Yes. Kind of clarification. Sure. How many subjects, so how many humans and how many chimpanzees have been done? Have been, have been mapped? Have been sequenced? Yes. We've done about 10,000 humans now. And on the chimpanzee side, it's less. It's in, in the tens, perhaps. But um, of those 10, or whatever the sample size is, they've all, there's very slight variations within those species but they're virtually identical. 